Today we're continuing our series called Vices. Has anybody gotten anything out of Vices yet? Yeah. Amen. I can see y'all still came to church, so it's not bothering you too much. Not exactly the most popular topic, but it's something that will help you experience the future that we long for. And of course, we started the last couple of weeks with Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. So God has plans for you. And they're plans to give you the future that you hope for. And all of us have a future that we hope for. Would you agree with that? Is there a future that you like to live? Yeah, all of us do. Even if you're not sure about God, you're kicking the tires on your faith. There are some things you would love to experience in your future. And what we've learned in this series is that you will never get to experience those things if you don't learn to live a life free of vices. And yet there are so many people that are struggling with vices, that are having a hard time uh, getting free of what is basically destructive behavior. We've defined vices as immoral or evil habits or practices. And vices include doing things like drinking alcohol, using recreational drugs, gambling, watching pornography, having sex out of marriage, and more. And if there are vice, vices in your life, the point of this series is to help you get free of them. And if you're somebody that's already free of them, we want to help you stay free and equip you to help somebody else get free. And so the first week we learned that we need to stop, that it is absolutely necessary that we stop whatever vices may, that we may have in our lives. We stop participating in them. We stop our engaging in them. And then last week, we learned that we shouldn't play with it. We talked specifically about alcohol and weed and learned that these are things we really shouldn't even play with at all. We answered the question, should Christians drink alcohol? Should Christians smoke weed? And we found the answer is, thank you for those two no's. I said we found the answer is, no, we should not. Today, I want to go in a different direction. And let me remind you, my goal here is not to teach you or tell you what to do with your life. My goal is to give you the scriptures and then have you go to God and ask him about it. Because I am totally confident that when you do that, God will talk to you about you. And so we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 20. And this is one where, honestly, I was a little surprised that God wanted me to spend time on. So we must need to talk about it. Somebody say, let's talk about it. I'm going to have to make y'all talk back to me during this series because this is one of those where people just kind of have to, you know, where people just kind of listen because it's kind of tough to hear sometimes. Well, Proverbs 23 verse 20 says, Do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons. Somebody say gluttons. For they are on their way to poverty, and too much sleep clothes them in rags. Do not hang out with people that are drunkards. We talked about them last week. People that drink alcohol, that become drunk. But then he mentions gluttons. And this is not the only time in the Bible that we see it mention gluttons. In fact, I won't take it there, but in Proverbs 28, verse 7, it reveals that even hanging out with the glutton is shameful. And in Deuteronomy 21, and verse 20 and 21, we see something that's really interesting. This is a part of the law. It says, in such case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way you will purge this, notice this, evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Well, can you imagine if kids who are super bad were told, hey, you know, you keep this up, I'm taking you to the town elders, and they will kill you. I mean, oh, if kids would act right pretty quickly. <laughs> Now, this isn't the law today, but this is part of what God required then because sin is contagious. 
And so when somebody chooses to consistently engage in sin, well, they've made their choice. God's not going to allow their choice to pollute other people. But notice the sin that's mentioned here, gluttony. Hmm. Philippians 3, 18 and 19 says this, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. The King James Version says their belly. The Amplified Bible says their stomach. So what's really God, what they're really serving is their stomach, their, their desire for food, among other things. They drag about, brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. Now, what's really interesting is as I was studying these scriptures, and there are more, uh, you find that when the Bible uses the word glutton, it actually is defined as to shake or to quake. And some of us probably have seen somebody who maybe is excessively overweight eat. And often you'll see them almost shaking, almost quaking out of this desire for this food. Gluttony itself is defined as excessive eating and drinking. Excessive eating and drinking. Overindulgence in food or drink. One commentary says this, the Bible mentions gluttony as a form of greed. Somebody say greed. And not to give into it. It is the greed for food. To want to consume more than is allotted or allowed by our bodies. Another commentary says this, gluttony is not only found in overconsumption, but an idolatrous expectation that looks to eating and drinking to provide sating in fullness for the soul, the inner person. So clearly gluttony is bad, sinful behavior. God says don't even be around people that commit this sin. Gluttony and drunkenness kind of run together because they're both characterized by overconsumption. And he got us talking about people who live this lifestyle. In fact, if you go back to Proverbs 23, verse 20 and 21, it says, Do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons, for they are on their way to poverty, and too much sleep clothes them in rags, meaning that this vice can rob you of prosperity. You drink a lot, it can cost you a lot of money. You eat a lot. It can cost you not only a lot of money, a lot of opportunities, not including it can cost you your health. And you know, in our society, if you think about it, how much money does the poor spend on alcohol? How much money does the poor spend on getting lottery tickets? How much money do the poor spend on cigarettes or eating out? I mean, if you just took some of the money that some spend just on those things and invested it, it will get them out of some of the financial trouble that they're in. And so that's what this is saying. I mean, you over-consume uh, and, and food and, and alcohol, for, then what's going to happen is that you're going to end up paying a price for it. So gluttony is a vice that's similar to, to drunkenness. Gluttony is a form of greed. And what we can really get from this is God doesn't want us to be gluttons. Now, I'm teaching this, and some of you are saying, well, Pastor, I don't know why you're talking about this. I'm not a glutton. Well, thank God. But are you? No, oh, Pastor, you coming after my food. I didn't come to church for you to come after my food. But there is a point where you might be eating a little too much. Thank you for those amens. I so appreciate you guys because I was feeling kind of lonely up here. Proverbs 23, verse 2. I mean, if gluttony is excessive eating and drinking, overindulgence in food, we have to ask, and God keeps talking about it in these terms, we have to ask ourselves, am I committing this sin? At the very least, we have to be aware in this area. 
putting them in my back pocket. Thank you for those amens. What are you getting to, Pastor? Proverbs 23, 2 says this. I won't read the whole context, but I think you'll get the point. Put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. That word appetite means greed is translated in another scripture, gluttony. Put a knife to your throat. So clearly, once again, this is a problem. And the context here is a little different because he's talking about, you know, basically someone trying to give you a bunch of food uh, to, in a sense, bribe you or deceive you. But you can still see here that he's talking about that there is a point where you need to operate in self-control when it comes to your food. There is a point where you've got to recognize that I cannot give in to my flesh where that extra pie, that those extra pieces of chicken. Come on now. Some of y'all getting hungry already. <laughs> it, it is, it's really something you should not have. And let's go a step farther because part of the problem some of us have is that we want to look better. We do not like what we see in the mirror. But for some reason, we can't change it. Why? We've developed the habit of overeating. And we're having a hard time breaking that vice off of our life. Whew. And the Bible says, here, put a knife to your throat. That's excessive, isn't it? Put a knife to my throat? Yeah, what's the point? Do whatever it takes to control yourself in this area. Put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. You know what else is interesting about the scripture? He's saying know yourself. Know your weaknesses. This doesn't just apply to this area. It applies to all the vices. We talked about how there's a sin that so easily besets everybody. Your sin, the one that might bother you or, or tempt you may not be the same as that tempts me. But you need to know yourself and so you can protect yourself from temptation. And here he's saying, man, if you're somebody that's given to appetite, you know that, put a knife to your throat. Do what it takes so that you don't give in to that. And which tells me that if you just allow your body or, or your flesh, as the Bible calls it, to do whatever you feel like doing, well, the results aren't going to be good. And how many people lose their lives simply because they don't follow this command? How many people lose their lives because they eat themselves into an early grave? 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Discipline it. One translation says, or if you, actually if you look up the original Hebrew, that word that's, the word that's used there means to hit under the eye. I'll give my body a black eye. It means to buffet. It means to subdue. So I'm, I'm, I'm hitting myself. I'm telling my body, shut up. Your body will scream for things you shouldn't have. Anybody ever notice that? Yeah, I tell my body to shut up, man. I keep it under. I, I stomp it. Nope, uh-uh. This is where fasting can be beneficial. Now, I think that a lot of teaching on fasting may not be t entirely accurate when you fast, the purpose of fasting is to take the time you would have used to eat or drink or whatever you're fasting of uh, or from and use that time to connect with God. That's really what fasting is about. It's not about keeping your body under necessarily, but one of the benefits of fasting food is that you do this scripture. You let your body know who's in charge because you're not a body. You're a spirit. You live in a body. And so, but if you're not careful, your body will run things. And so you, the real you, has to from time to time tell your, your body, nope, I'm not being driven by you. I'm being led by God. And so here he's saying, man, you ought to bring your body into subjection. Paul goes on to say here, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Once again, if you just let your body do what it wants, it will lead to bad things. So pastor, I get all of this. What does this have to do with me? What's the point? Proverbs 15, 26. If you find honey, eat just enough. Somebody say just enough. just enough. 
too much of it, and you will vomit. In fact, help me with something here. So my man's got a balloon, and I'm going to ask him to go ahead and blow. Go ahead and blow, blow that balloon up. Now, you see what happens when you got too much? Pop. There's just enough air that goes into the balloon. And then there's a place where you, eat, you just have too much air going into the balloon. And when that happens, you got a problem. So what do you do? You put in just enough. Somebody say just enough. Yes, Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, Pastor, how do I apply this teaching? When you, as you eat, you need to ask yourself and the Holy Spirit in you, am I eating too much? Turn to somebody, tell them, ask yourself and the Holy Spirit, am I eating too much? Turn to somebody and tell them, ask yourself and the Holy Spirit, Am I eating too much? Turn, my, turn to somebody else and say, I didn't say you tell me. I said, ask yourself and the Holy Spirit. Am I eating too much? What do you, why, what's the point of all this, Pastor? God wants you to be, not to be greedy, but to be godly. Somebody say that, be greedy, don't be greedy, be godly. All right, Proverbs 28. I was surprised the Lord wanted me to go there, but I think it's a good one to look at. We have to sometimes ask ourselves, am I being gluttonous? Even on Thanksgiving, even on Memorial Day, even at a birthday. There's one other scripture I didn't take you to, but Ecclesiastes 10, 17 talks about eating for to gain strength, not to get drunk. And there's a balance there. Right? I, the Bible teaches you can enjoy your food, but there comes a place where you are enjoying a little too much of it. So that's why he said, if you find honey, enjoy your honey. It's sweet. It tastes good. But eat just enough. Okay. Proverbs 28, verse 20. I'll tell you, this series has been so popular. People are shouting and running down the street. Woo, this vice. No, they ain't doing none of that. All right. Proverbs 28, verse 20. Well, I mean, we're getting free of some stuff, though. That adjustment right there might save some folk. It might help you drop 20 pounds. It might help you get that husband you've been believing for. Or that wife you've been believing for. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to keep meddling. I got to stay on point. All right, let's go to another one. This one's a little controversial. I don't know why. Proverbs 28, 20. The trustworthy person will get a rich reward. The King James says a faithful person. And the word faithful means somebody that has moral fidelity. They're loyal. They're devoted to a cause. They're steady. So the steady person gets up, goes to work, gets up, goes to work, gets up, goes to work. You know, just stays at doing the right thing. The Bible says that guy's going to get a rich reward. But a person who wants quick riches, somebody say quick riches, will get into what? Trouble. You look up the original Hebrew because the Old Testament comes from the Hebrew. It, it uses the words to press, to hurry. The one that's pressing to get rich. The one that's in a hurry to get rich. That person will not be innocent. It means they won't be clean. What does that mean? That means before God, they're dirty. They're shady. Well, pastor, what, why, why are we looking at this scripture? Because this is a great, great description of gambling. It's a great description of gambling. In fact, here's an, another translation of this. Proverbs 28, 20, verse, and the message translation says, committed and persistent work pays off. Get rich quick schemes are rip-offs. Ooh. Ooh. See, gambling is ultimately about winning as much money as you can as quick as possible. That's why people play the lottery, right? People head to Vegas. And I don't know, some people say, well, I just do it for fun. We're going to get to that. But at its heart, it's about winning money you did not earn. 
In fact, if you look at a definition for gambling, it's defined as the activity or practice of playing at a game of chance for money or other stakes. And it's the game, the game isn't the problem. The problem is the goal of the game. It's, and it's not just a game where you're working hard, you're playing like a sport or something. No, it's a game of chance that you're playing with the goal of winning money. The Bible says, man, you, the person that's trying to get quick riches, they're going to get in trouble. The person that's after get rich quick, quick schemes, they'll find their ripoffs. The reason why casinos are so elaborate, why they are some of the most gorgeous buildings you ever find. I mean, you go to downtown Detroit, I, I would argue the most beautiful buildings in the city are the casinos. Why? They have a ton of money. Why do they have a ton of money? From ripping off poor people. That's what the lottery is. It is a tax on the poor. So they, 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 the poor who are uneducated or don't know the things of God go and spend their money in this way, trying to get rich quick because money is the answer to all of my problems. And majority of the time they lose. And then government tries to justify it and say, well, we'll use that money for, to, to educate our children. Well, It's wrong. And we can see here in the Bible it's something that Christians should not be doing. In fact, I'll, I'll, there's a lot of scriptures on this. In fact, Proverbs 119 talks about being greedy of gain because this is greed driven. And we already said, don't be greedy, be godly. This is greed driven. So it says, don't be greedy of gain in Proverbs 119. Proverbs 15, 27 says, the one that's greedy of gain troubles his own house. Proverbs 21, 25 and 26 says, the, the lazy covet greedily. They want, they, they want that money. They got to have that money. Ephesians 4, 19 shows us it's sinners, people who don't follow God, who are greedy. First Timothy 3 talks about how a minister is not qualified to be a minister if he's greedy of money. Jude 1, 11 talks about individuals who ran greedily after some things for reward. I mean, greed is a bad thing, whether it's greed for food or greed for money. And greed for food can lead to overeating. Greed for money can lead to gambling. And it's not a good thing. In fact, 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 says this, Come on, let me ask, let me say it this way. If you, if somebody were to run into the store across the street with the gun and, and, and rob that store for the money that they happen to have in the cash register, would anybody say they did a good thing? No. Why would they do that good thing? They're greedy for money they didn't earn. But for some reason, if I go down and I pull a lever, we see it as different. Well, you may not in one sense be putting somebody's life in jeopardy. I mean, obviously you bring a gun into any situation. That's a dangerous thing. There's a reason why you are penalized for that. But the person you're penalizing when you go gamble in a, in a casino is yourself. You're troubling yourself. You're troubling your house. First Timothy 6 verse 9 says, but those who crave to be rich fall into temptation and they snare, that's a trap. It's like a bear trap, you step in it and, right? How, how do you get a mouse? You, you put out something the mouse wants. Maybe a little cheese, and I remember there's one video, we actually tried to use this in our movie Match Made, uh, but you know, you had this one video of this little mouse and it was just dancing around, singing to this little piece of, of cheese. It was so excited about this cheese, and it's dancing and singing to the cheese, and it, it goes to get to the cheese, and once it grabs it, don't eat the cheese, right? That's, that's exactly how this works. You get to chasing after money, so the place where you will gamble for it, you're going to find you're in a trap. It goes on to say here, it's a snare, and, and they, they fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish, useless, godless, and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction and miserable perishing. For the love of money, what's, that, what's the love of money? Is it having money? Is it even believing for money? No, but craving it, being greedy about it, being willing to do anything to get it, immoral, shady things, that's the root of all evil. All evil. You look at what's happening in our world, and a lot of things that are evil in our world are a result of 
the love of money. I'm just going to leave that alone because I end up going down a road I don't need to right now. It is through this craving that some have been led astray and have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many acute mental pains. So what we're seeing here is that this compulsion to, be, to strike it rich can actually uh, lead to both spiritual and physical destruction. That loving or chasing after money can lead you away from God and cost you everything. Does it sound like gambling is a good idea to you? If that's not enough, let me read to you a little bit of information about it. One article teaches us about how can gambling affect my mental health? They go on to say that gambling can cause low self-esteem, stress, anxiety, and depression if gambling becomes a problem. Gambling can become an addiction, just like drugs or alcohol, if you use it compulsively or feel out of control. Gambling can affect the part of our brain that releases dopamine, a feel-good hormone that creates feelings of pleasure and reward. When we win a bet, our brain gives us an emotional reward. If you get addicted to gambling, other pleasurable activities may longer make you feel good, so instead you will gamble to get the same buzz. This sounds a lot like alcohol. It sounds a lot like drugs. It sounds a lot like porn. They all do the same thing. That's why I ran across one article, and they talk about what they call sin stocks. And they were talking about that these are stocks that you can invest in that are associated with some type of unethical behavior. And so they, sin stock industries include tobacco, uh, alcohol, cannabis, adult entertainment, and gambling. Well, it, it's a vice. It fits right in with all the rest. It does the same thing to you as all the rest. And yes, some people might be able to gamble and they don't become addicted to it, but there are others who will gamble and they will become addicted to it. You don't know which one is you. So why play with it, right? Don't play with it. Another study, this is with Dr. Timothy Fong of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program. He writes of gambling addiction. Without a doubt, we know it's an actual brain disease. There are brain changes that explain why people can't stop. Another study says there's also a strong leap between gambling problems and thoughts of suicide. And there's just there's way too much research on this for Christians to play with it, for us to allow ourselves to be driven by greed, particularly to the place where I'm going to do, I'm going to play games of chance to win money. And this is part of the challenge we're seeing in our culture today. They have now elevated gambling to another level by allowing sports gambling. And so now you can't watch a game, you hardly can drive down the street without seeing some advertisement for one of these gambling sites and 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 it's just as destructive as going as you know seeing all the advertisement we see for marijuana or any other vice but I, I, let me go a little farther before I go too far with this let's look at John chapter 19 If you think about it, gambling is all about getting, not giving. Does that sound godly? Even when God brings you wealth, it's to get you, to bless you, but to you can be a blessing. But if I get money from gambling, and there's nothing there, and I'm not doing that to be a blessing. Now you might tell yourself, oh, pastor, when I win the lottery, I'm bringing a big fat tie, check the FX church. <laughs> We're going to lay hands on you in the name of Jesus and get you free. Because that's not how God prospers people. In fact, I, I'm, I'm going to go here right now. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Let me just look at, go there first. How does God prosper people? I, I know there are Christians that feel differently about this, but I think we need to just actually look at the Bible. Right? And, and if you're gambling, maybe ask yourself, what's really motivating me to gamble? What's really behind this? Well, I just do it for fun. There are other things you can do for fun that won't potentially be addictive, that don't support industries that rob the poor. 
So why are you really doing this? Can you not have fun other ways? Is it possible that you're gambling because you're treating money as God? Believing that money is the answer to all of my problems. I've had conversations with people. They get in trouble financially. And so what do they do? They run down to the casino and hope to win the money they need to pay off a bill. And usually what happens? They end up losing and end up in a worse position. But are you, are you gambling? This is why people play the lottery, you know, because if I could just win this money, I'd be all right. My life would be good. You see money as the answer to all of your problems? That means it's replaced God in your life. And the Bible says you can't serve God and money. So you've chosen the money over God. How does God prosper us? Well, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he what? Eat. How does God get money in your hands? Now, God's word is very clear that God will make you rich financially. God wants to make you rich financially. And I know there's some people that have a problem with that. I don't really care about their religious philosophy. I care about what the Bible says. And the Bible says over and over and over again that God will make you rich. The blessing of the Lord and make it rich. 2 Corinthians 9 11, you'll be made rich in all things. I mean, we could go on and on. We did a whole series on it last summer. We know the Bible says that, but the question is how does God get riches to his people? One of the ways, a main way, is through your job. Another way God gets riches to you is through giving you God ideas. Right? He'll give you an invention. He'll give you something that you should be pursuing. You should be creating. That's also really a job. Another way God will give money to you is through people giving to you. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Show what? Men given to your bosom. And if you go throughout the Bible, you see all of that happening over and over and over again. People worked hard, God made them rich. People had God ideas, God made them rich. People were serving God, God made them a money magnet for him, and money came their way. But do you know what you never, ever, 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 not one time see in the Bible? God making somebody rich through gambling. Not one time do you see in the Bible how God told somebody, go and throw some dice, and I'm going to bless it, and I'm going to make you rich. Come on, pull that lever and yell, money coming to me in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to make you rich. Come on, go ahead and do that raffle, and I'm going to bless you. No, whoa, 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 whoa. If it's godly, shouldn't we see it in the Bible? If this is how God gets money to us, shouldn't we see it in the Bible? So if we don't see it in the Bible, then why do we think it's acceptable as Christians to believe that that's somehow a way I'm supposed to get riches? We shouldn't. Those of us who are Christians should not be gambling. Gambling is simply not God's method to make you rich. John chapter 19, verse 23 and 24 says, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice from my clothing. So this is what they did. Here's one of the proofs that the Bible is not just a book, it's God's word, that Jesus is not just a man, that he is the son of God. It was that the Bible prophesied or predicted hundreds of years before that he would be crucified and at his crucifixion, they would gamble for his clothes. How is that even possible? Because God sits outside of time. He can tell us what's going to happen. And sometimes he does that just to prove to you that he is real. But notice what what they were doing. Jesus is literally dying on the cross. This is a brutal execution. And they're over here gambling for his clothes. They don't know God. They don't care about what's right and wrong. It was actual regular practice to take the clothes of people who were being crucified. It just wasn't a regular practice to gamble for a particular piece of clothes. That's what made this different. But you can see here, this is what people who don't know God do. We love them. We want to tell them about Jesus. We're not trying to clean the fish before we catch the fish. They need Jesus. I'm not going to try to talk to them about their gambling, their drinking, their this, that, and the other. No, 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 no. We need to get you to heaven. 
We need to get you to God. Once we get you to God, God will help you with the rest. But when you know God, you should not be engaged in this type of behavior. Sinners gamble, saints should not. When it's all said and done, is the risk, oh, you know, let me read this story to you. I like something somebody said. They said, gambling does not represent humanity at its best. Let me say that first. It's in fact, they said, whether it's standing in line for a gas station lotto ticket or operating a slot machine, gambling does not represent humanity at its best. Some might respond that it can be harmless entertainment, but even there, there's nothing inherently noble about it. There's nothing good about it. So there's a story in this book called The Princess and Curdy. And in the story, a young man named Curdy was out playing with a bow and arrow when he impulsively took aim at a bird. And when he dropped it, he realized to his horror that it was the queen's pet pigeon. So his shoulders slumped, he went to the castle and he brought it to the queen and he said, I didn't mean to do any harm, ma'am. And she responded, you say you didn't mean to do any harm, but did you mean any good, Curdy? Did you mean any good? No, he answered. And then she said, remember then that whoever does not mean good is always in danger of harm. When you gamble, do you mean good? No. Don't be greedy. Be godly. Turn to him and tell him, don't be greedy. Be godly. Find somebody else tell them, I said, don't be greedy, be godly. Now, I want to end this by just mentioning to you, of course, we've been giving you some keys to being vice-free. I told you we were going to give you 10, but as I started studying, I ended up with 12. 12. 12. All right? So let's walk through a couple of them. Number one, agree with God about your vice. How do I beat this? Agree with God that if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Number two, Commit to turning away from your vice. Say, God, I'm done with this. I'm going to war against this vice in my life. Number three, accept that Jesus has washed away your guilt. He's washed away your sin. Don't carry the guilt of what you used to do. Number four, remove yourself from the presence of the vice. Don't put yourself in a position where it's easy for you to do this again. If you've got a gambling problem, well, you don't have any business in a casino, right? Number five, check on the inside before you indulge in a vice. Before I do this, let me see and hear what I have. Because if I got that, mm, this ain't right feeling, I need to let it go. Number six, spend time in prayer instead of with the vice. And today I want to give you number seven, and that is focus on heavenly things, not earthly ones. Focus on heavenly things, not earthly ones. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on on things above, not on things on the earth, which means that he's talking about what you focus on. Somebody say focus. He's saying you need to focus on things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above. You know, as a sports fan, and you guys know I'm a huge sports fan, that it's kind of hard for me to get into the playoffs in any sport when my team isn't in it. Doesn't mean I won't watch it, but I just don't enjoy it as much if there's not a Detroit team in it. Why? Because somewhere long ago, I set my affection on Detroit teams. So for me, you know, I am for the Pistons, even now. I'm for the Lions, which is finally paying off. I'm for the Red Wings. I'm for the Tigers. I'm for the Wolverines. Sorry, Spartans, but... I set my affection on those teams. That's, so anything that helps them, I'm for it. Anything that hurts them, I'm against it. That's where I am. And God is saying, really, we should set our, our affection on heavenly things, spiritual things, not on earthly things, not on non-spiritual things. They really shouldn't be what we're truly focused on. In other words, get your mind out of, your, out of the gutter and get your mind on the glory. Instead of thinking about this vice, no, let me, I don't, I, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not about that anymore. I've got more important things to do in my life. Then number eight, this is important. Be accountable to a friend about that vice. 
be accountable to a friend about that vice. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man, a friend sharpens a friend. As iron sharpens iron, iron is not sharpened by yourself. You've got to have another piece. And the same thing is true with each and every one of us. A man needs another man to help him be sharp. It didn't even say a man is sharpened by reading the Bible. It didn't say a man is sharpened by praying. It didn't say a man is sharpened by serving, listening to messages. All of that stuff is great. It's good stuff. But as a man, you will never be sharp without another godly man in your life as a friend. As a woman, you will never be spiritually sharp without a godly woman in your life. And, 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 and sharpening is a key uh, term here because it implies there's some friction. You need some godly friction in your life. You need somebody in your life that can hold you accountable. In fact, uh, there's a couple of accountability questions I came across that a friend should be asking you. Have you succumbed to temptation since we talked last? When have you been tempted and what have you done about it? How has your time of Bible study and prayer been? What have you not told me that you should have? What have I not asked that I should have asked? See, if you know that your friend is going to be calling you, asking you about the last time you was going to the casino, you might not go to the casino. You might know what I'm talking about. Hey, 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 hey when's the last time? Did you, have you been smoking weed since the last time we talked? Yeah, dog, man. My, that, that, that friend going to be like, hey, man, come on. You got to stop. Remember why you're not doing that? Do you realize what's going to happen to you if you keep doing that? See, I've had some people in my life that can say to me in those tough moments, you cannot do what you're tempted to do. Don't do that. If you do that, you're going to blow everything up. I know you got this problem, but you just cannot do that. And when that is said to me, that helps me. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me keep. Nope, I can't. I can't. Because when you're struggling or you're tempted, there's a part of you that's like, hey, I just, I just, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm tired. I, 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 just, I, I deserve it. No, 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 no. That friend can kind of get you straight, and you need that in your life. And one thing you can get from this scripture and others is that you really have a godly responsibility to develop this type of friendship in your life. It is up to you. I can't find any friends. That's your fault. And I know at this church, I love y'all, but we've been talking to y'all about groups for five years, and 80% of y'all do not go. And then I hear people about, I ain't got no godly friends. They sit here in your church. Godly people who will help you, but you will not prioritize relationship. And then you blow something up. When God is saying, man, you need a friend. You need a friend. That's why this is in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one. If you're in trouble and you're by yourself, woe to you. But if you got a friend, they can pick you up. If you in battle, and you, it's just you against the enemy, you in trouble. But if there's two of you, y'all can fight this off. And if there's three of you, man, you're in It's all over the Bible. You're not going to defeat your vice without having a godly friend that you can be accountable to. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. But what if I mess up, pastor? That's when you go to that friend and they help you get back up on your feet. And what happened, the Bible says a just man falls seven times, but he rises up again. What happens is you rise again until you get to the place where you finally overcome that vice. Which ultimately, what I want you to help you get a hold of today is that we cannot allow greed to run our lives. Greed of food, greed of money, that we need to learn to operate in self-control and let God help us truly live the future that he has for us. And so come on, lift your hands toward heaven. Tune to our weekly podcast where you'll be able to listen to the message from our Sunday experience. Our podcast is available on platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and more. Be sure to check us out, subscribe, and share.